Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Black Swan Green by David Mitchell, the author of Cloud Atlas. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs. I have quite a number for this one, so it'll be a little bit of a longer review. And then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end, so... Dane reads... January 1982. 13-year-old Jason Taylor, covert stammerer and reluctant poet, anticipates a stultifying year in his backwater English village. But he hasn't reckoned with bullies, simmering family discord, the Falklands War, a threatened gypsy invasion and those mysterious entities known as girls. Charting 13 months in the black hole between childhood and adolescence, this is a captivating novel, wry, painful and vibrant with the stuff of life. So let's check out some tab. And I just thought this was interesting. This is how the book starts. This is literally the opening couple of paragraphs, but I thought it does a good job of setting the scene and introducing the characters or the main character. Do not set foot in my office. That's dad's rule. But the phone had rung 25 times. Normal people give up after 10 or 11, unless it's a matter of life or death, don't they? Dad's got an answering machine like James Garner's in the Rockford Files with big reels of tape, but he stopped leaving it switched on recently. 30 rings the phone got to. Julia couldn't hear it up in her converted attic because Don't You Want Me by Human League was thumping out dead loud. 40 rings. Mum couldn't hear because the washing machine was on berserk cycle and she was hoovering the living room. 50 rings. That's just not normal. Suppose Dad had been mangled by a juggernaut on the M5 and the police only had this office number because all his other ID had got incinerated. We could lose our final chance to see our charred father in the terminal ward. So I went in, thinking of the bride going into Bluebeard's chamber after being told not to. Bluebeard, mind, was waiting for that to happen. Dad's office smells of pound notes, papery but metallic too. The blinds were down so it felt like evening, not ten in the morning. There's a serious clock on the wall, exactly the same make as the serious clocks on the walls at school. There's a photo of Dad shaking hands with Craig Salt when Dad got made regional sales director for Greenland. Greenland the supermarket chain, not Greenland the country. Dad's IBM computer sits on the steel desk. Thousands of pounds IBM's cost. The office phone's red like a nuclear hotline and it's got buttons you push, not the dial you get on normal phones. And again, some more here that I want to read out. Uh, this We meet his friend Moron, uh, Dean. Moron's my height and he's okay, but Jesus, he pongs of gravy. Moron wears ankle flappers from charity shops and lives down Drugger's End in a brick cottage that pongs of gravy too. His real name's Dean Moran, rhymes with Warren. But our PE teacher, Mr. Carver, started calling him Moron in our first week and it stuck. I'd call him Dean if we were on our own, but names aren't just names. Kids who are really popular get called by their first names, so Nick Yu's always just Nick. Kids who are a bit popular, like Gilbert Swinyard, have sort of respectful nicknames like Yardy. Next down are kids like me who call each other by our surnames. Below us are kids with piss take nicknames like Moran Moron, or Nicholas Breyer who's Nicholas Bra. It's all ranks being a boy, like the army. If I called Gilbert Swinyard just Swinyard, he'd kick my face in. Or if I called Moron Dean in front of everyone, it'd damage my own standing. So you gotta watch out. Girls don't do this so much, except for Dawn Madden, who's a boy gone wrong in some experiment. Girls don't scrap so much as boys either. That said, just before we broke up for Christmas, Dawn Madden and Andrea Bozard started yelling bitch and slag in the bus queues after school, punching tits and pulling hair and everything they were. Wish I'd been born a girl sometimes. They're generally loads more civilised, but if I ever admitted that out loud, I'd get bum old plumber scrawled on my locker. That happened to Floyd Chasley for admitting he liked Johann Sebastian Bach. Mind you, if they knew Elliot Bolivar, who gets poems printed in the Black Swan Green Parish magazine, was me, they'd gouge me to death behind the tennis courts with blunt woodwork tools and spray the Sex Pistols logo on my gravestone. We get, I didn't dare ask what a brummy was, in case it's the same as bummer or bum boy, which means homo. Brummy is somebody from Birmingham for you American folks, which is from pretty much where I'm from. And then he ends up playing British Bulldogs, which I used to hate when people played that at school. For the same reason, it gets very violent. Screaming like kamikazes, we charged. I slipped over, accidentally on purpose, just before the front wave of runners smashed into the bulldogs. This would tie up most of the hardest bulldogs in fights with our front runners. Bulldogs have to pin down both shoulders of runners onto the ice for long enough to shout British Bulldogs 1, 2, 3. With luck, my strategy had cleared some spaces to dodge through and onto our home goalposts. My plan worked pretty well at first. The Tookie brothers and Gary Drake all crashed into Nick U. A flying leg kicked my shin, but I got past them without coming a cropper. But then Ross Wilcox come homing in on me. I tried to wriggle past, but Wilcox got a firm grip on my wrist and tried to pull me down. But instead of trying to struggle free, I got a firmer grip on his wrist and flung him off of me straight into Ant Little and Darren Croom. Ace in the face or what? Games and sports aren't about taking part or even about winning. Games and sports are really about humiliating your enemies. Lee Biggs tried a poxy rugby tackle on me, but I shook him free no sweat. He's too worried about the teeth he's got left to be a decent bulldog. I was the fourth runner home. Grant, per Grant Birch shouted, nice work, JC boy. Nick, you had fought three of the Tuckies and Gary Drake and got home too. 
About a third of the runners got captured and turned into bulldogs for the next pass. I hate that about British bulldogs. It forces you to be a traitor. We get this little line. There's rumours Pluto and Oak smoked cannabis, but obviously it wasn't the type that cauliflowerizes your brain and makes you jump off roofs onto railings. Mmm, indeed. Not that kind of cannabis. We get a reference to Julia, his sister, has got to get back to her homework of Robert Peel and the Enlightened Wigs. He was from Tamworth, my hometown. I've actually been writing about him recently uh, for a book that my granddad's written, but my granddad has quite severe dyslexia, so I kind of take his notes and build on that for him. The grotesquest thing I ever heard was this. Pete Redmorley swore on his nan's grave it's true, so I suppose it must be. This boy in the sixth form was sitting his A-levels. He had these parents from Hallyu put him under massive pressure to get a whole raft of A-grades, and when the exam came, this kid just crapped and couldn't even understand the questions. So what he did was get two big biros from his pencil case, hold the pointy ends against his eyes, stand up and headbutt the desk, right there in the exam hall. The pen skewered his eyeballs so deep that only an inch was left sticking out of his drippy sockets. Mr Nixon, the headmaster, hushed everything up so it didn't get in the papers or anything. It's a sick and horrible story, but right now I'd rather kill Hangman that way than let him kill me tomorrow morning. I mean that. So Hangman is uh, the kind of his name for the presence in his head that makes him stutter. And he's seeing someone called Mrs. Daru and she says, Speech therapy is as imperfect as science, Jason, as speaking is a complex one. There are 72 muscles involved in the production of human speech. The neural connections my brain is employing now to say this sentence to you, number in the tens of millions. Little wonder one study put the percentage of people with some kind of speech disorder at 12%. Don't put your faith in a miracle cure. In the vast majority of cases, progress doesn't come from trying to kill a speech defect. Try to will it out of existence. It'll just will itself back stronger, right? No, it's a question, and this might sound nutty, of understanding it, of coming to a working accommodation with it, of respecting it, of not fearing it. Yes, it'll flare up from time to time, but if you know why it flares, you'll know how to douse what makes it flare up. Back in Durban, I had a friend who'd once been an alcoholic. One day I asked him how he'd cured himself. My friend said he'd done no such thing. I said, what do you mean you haven't touched a drop in three years? He said all he'd done was become a teetotal alcoholic. That's my goal, to help people change from being stammering stammerers into non-stammering stammerers. Mrs. Dorey's no fool, and that all makes sense, but it's subtle help for 2KM's form assembly tomorrow morning, because he's supposed to deliver a, a talk in front of the school, and he's, he's dreading it. Uh, so there's a little, like, gathering happening, and he pours a bag of Twiglets into a dish and observes, Twiglets are snacks that adults think kids like, but they taste of burnt matches dipped in Marmite. Which is true, that is exactly what they taste like. We get a reference to George Orwell. I've got everything he ever wrote, including a first edition, 1984. And I just thought this was good. This is a, like a childhood fight, and again, very well written here. The fighters sized each other up in front of the hollow log. Grant Birch has got an inch or two over Ross Wilcox, but Ross Wilcox is nuclear. Gary Drake and Wayne Nash had come as his lieutenants. Wayne Nash used to be one of the Upton punks, briefly became an Upton new romantic, but now he's firmly an Upton mod. He's an utter thicko. Gary Drake's no thicko though, he's in my form at school, but Gary Drake's Ross Wilcox's cousin so they're always dossing about together. Fuck off home to mummy, Grant Birch told Ross Wilcox, while well, you still can. A dirty opener that, everyone knows about Ross Wilcox's mum. Ross Wilcox gobbed up Grant Birch's feet, make me fuck off. Grant Birch looked at the gob on his trainers, you're gonna be cleaning that off with your fucking tongue piss flaps. Make me. Don't make shit, it comes natural. Really original line, that Birch. Hate smells of burnt dead fireworks. And it tastes like fucking, what they're called, I've already forgotten. Those food things, Twiglet. We get a reference to Margaret Thatcher because she was the Prime Minister at the time that this was set. Uh, Mrs Thatcher was on TV yesterday talking to a bunch of school kids about cruise missiles. The only way to stop a playground bully, she said, as sure of her truth as the blue of her eyes, is to show to the bully that if he thumps you, then you can jolly well thump him back a lot harder. But the threat of being thumped back never stopped Ross Wilcox and Grant Birch scrapping, did it? And we get this long old bit here, which I obviously do not agree with, but again, it's a sign of the times. Mrs Thatcher frazzled this twerpy prat in a bow tie on BBC One this evening. He was saying sinking the General Belgrano outside the total exclusion zone was morally and legally wrong. Actually, we sank the Belgrano some days ago, but the papers have just got hold of the pictures. And since the Sheffield, we've got zero sympathy for the argy bastards. Mrs Thatcher fixed a stained glass blue eyes on that pillock and pointed out that the enemy cruiser had been zigzagging in and out of the zone all day. She said something like, The fathers and mothers of our country did not elect me the Prime Minister of this country to gamble with the lives of their sons over questions of legal niceties. Must I remind you that we are a country at war? 
The whole studio cheered and the whole country cheered too, I reckon. Except for Michael Foote and Red Ken Livingston and Anthony Wedgwood Ben and all those loony lefties. Mrs Thatcher's bloody ace. She's so strong, so calm, so sure. Loads more use than the Queen who hasn't said a dicky bird since the war began. Some countries like Spain are saying we shouldn't have fired on the Belgrano, but the only reason so many RGs drowned was that the other ships in its convoy scarpered off instead of saving their own men. Our Royal Navy would never, ever, ever leave Britons to drown like that. And anyway, when you join the Army or Navy in any country, you're paid to risk your life, like Tom Yu. Now Galtieri is trying to get us back to the negotiating table, but Maggie's told him the only thing she'll discuss is the United Nations Resolution 502, Argentina's unconditional withdrawal from British soil. Some RG diplomat in New York, still harping on about the Belgrano being outside the zone, said Britain no longer rules the waves, it just waves the rules, great line. The Daily Mail says it's typical of a tin pot Latin paper pusher to make stupid quips about life and death. The Daily Mail says the RG should have thought about the consequences before they stuck their poxy blue and white flag on our sovereign colony. The Daily Mail is dead right. The Daily Mail says that Leopoldo Galtieri only invaded the Falklands to distract attention from all his own people he's tortured, murdered and pushed out of helicopters over the sea. The Daily Mail is dead right again. The Daily Mail says Galtieri's brand of patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. The Daily Mail is as right as Margaret Thatcher. All England's turned into a dynamo. People are queuing up outside hospitals to donate blood. Mr Whitlock spent most of our biology lessons saying how certain patriotic young men cycled to Worcester Hospital to give blood. Everyone knows he was talking about Gilbert Swinyard and Pete Redmarley. They were told by a nurse that they're too young. So Mr Whitlock's writing to Michael Spicer, our Member of Parliament, to complain that the children of England are being denied the right to contribute to the war effort. His letter's already in the Malvern Gazetteer. So much wrong with that, but that's the way people used to think, you know? And again, some more on the war. God knows who's winning and who's losing now. There's a rumour the Soviet Union's feeding the Argentinian satellite pictures of our fleet, which is why they always know where to find us. Brezhnev's dying or dead, so nobody knows what's going on in the Kremlin. Neil Brose said that if that's true, then Ronald Reagan will have to get involved because of the NATO alliance. Then World War Three might start. The Daily Mail listed all the lies the junta are telling their people. It made me livid. John Knott, our Minister of Defence, would never lie to us. Julia asked how I knew we weren't being lied to. We're British, I told her. Why would the government lie? Hmm. Julia replied that it was to assure us that our wonderful war is going swimmingly when in fact it's going down the toilet. But, went my answer, we're not being lied to. Julia said that's exactly what Argentinian people will be saying right now. Julia has a point. We get Julia reads The Guardian, which has got all sorts of stuff not in the Daily Mail. Most of the 30,000 enemy soldiers, she says, were just conscripts and Indians. Their elite troops all raced back to Port Stanley as the British paratroopers advanced. Some of the ones they left behind got killed by bayonets. Haven't your intestines pulled out through a slit in the belly? What a 1914 way to die in 1982. Brian Hanrahan said he saw one prisoner being interviewed who said they didn't even know what the Malvinas were or why they'd been brought there. Julia says the main reasons we won were A, the Argentinians couldn't buy any more exocets, B, their navy stayed holed up in mainland bases, C, their air force ran out of trained pilots. Julia says it would have been cheaper to set every Falkland Islander up with their own farm in the Cotswolds than to have gone to war. She reckons nobody will pay to clean up the mess so that much of the farmland on the islands will be off limits until the mines have rusted. A hundred years that might take. Today's big story in the Daily Mail is about whether Cliff Richard the singer's having sex with Sue Barker the tennis player or whether they're just good friends. Apparently they were just good friends. I like this as well. Um, they talked talk about how uh, the British soldiers were uh, saying that the, the Falkland soldiers were like, uh, the Argentinian soldiers were like Benny the dimwit handyman from Crossroads on TV. They even started calling the islanders Bennies. I'm not making this up. I met a Benny this morning who thought a silicon chip was a Sicilian crisp. Soon everyone in the lower ranks was saying Benny this and Benny that. When the officers found out, an order was issued to get the men to stop using this name. The men stopped. But a day or two later, Tom was hauled over by his lieutenant, who demanded to know why the crew were referring to the locals not as Bennies, but as Stills. So I told the lieutenant, because they're still Bennies, sir. But he does start to understand the harsh kind of realities of war. And so we get this line. Me, I want to bloody click this moronic bloody world in the bloody teeth over and over till it bloody understands that not hurting people is ten bloody thousand times more bloody important than being right. So some thoughts on religion here. People are always buried facing west so at the end of time when the last trumpet blows all the dead people will claw their way up and walk due west to the throne of Jesus to be judged. From black swan green that means the throne of Jesus will be in Aberystwyth. Suicide's mind get buried facing north. They won't be able to find Jesus because dead people only walk in straight lines. They'll all end up in John O'Groats. Aberystwyth's a bit of a dive but dad says John O'Groats is just a few houses where Scotland runs out of Scotland. 
Isn't no god better than one who does that to people? Well, yes. And again, again he, he writes these poems and publishes them in the local paper under a fake name. Um, he says, if you show someone something you've written, you give them a sharpened stake, lie down in your coffin and say, when you're ready. So this woman he meets, um, he asks her, are you a poet? Mm. No, that title is hazardous. But I had intimacy with poets when I was young. Robert Graves wrote a poem of me, not his best. William Carlos Williams asked me to abandon my husband and, she uttered the word like a pantomime witch, elope. Very romantic, but I had a pragmatic head and he was destitute as epouvantail. Uh, how you say the man in a field who frights birds? Scarecrow. Scarecrow, exactly. So I tell him, go to the hell, Willie. Our souls eat poetry, but one has seven deadly sins to feed. He consented my logic. Poets are listeners if they are not intoxicated, but novelists. Madame Kromelnik did a yuck face. Is schizoids, lunatics, liars. Henry Miller stayed in our colony on Taormina. A pig, a perspiring pig, and Hemingway, you know? I'd heard of him, so I nodded. Lecherous is pig in the entire farm. Cinematographers? <laughs> Petty Zeus of their universes. The world is their own film set. Charles Chaplin also, he was my neighbour in Geneva across the lake. A charming petit Zeus, but a petit Zeus. Painters squeeze their hearts dry to make the pigments. No heart remains for people. Look at that Andalusian goat, Picasso. His biographers come for my stories of him, beg, offer money, but I tell them, go to the hell, I am not a human jukebox. Composers, my father was one, Vivian Ayres. His ears were burnt with his music. I, or my mother, he rarely listened. Formidable in his generation, but now he has fallen from the repertory. He exiled at Zedelhelm, south of Bruges. My mother's estate was there. My native tongue is Flemish, so you hear, English is not an adroit tongue for me. Too many lesses and lessnesses. You think I am French? I nodded. Belgian. The destiny of discreet neighbours is to be confused with the noisy ones next door. Oh, and she gets uh, Margate, she calls it Madgate, which is shitgate. Great little line. Listening's reading if you close your eyes. Music's a wood you walk through. And then he's still talking to Madame Kromelnik and she says, Tell me, who are your teachers? We've got different teachers for different subjects. I mean, what are the writers you revere most greatly? Oh, I mentally scan my bookshelf for the most impressive names. Isaac Asimov, Ursula Le Guin, John Wyndham. Assi Smurf, Ursula Le Guin. Vindham? These are modern poets? No, sci-fi fantasy. Stephen King too, he's horror. And she, in fact, is horrified. So she recommends he reads Chekhov, Herman Hesse, uh, let's see who else. Oh, and Kafka. Oh, also Alain Fournier. So he reads it in French. And we get a reference to a Gribo in the corner reading Kerrang. And uh, Gribo's is the title of the novel that I'm working on at the moment. Agrivo is like a sort of sweaty little rocker guy, you know? And I just thought this bit, it's one of those where it's written grossly but well, you know? Piss drummed on the bathroom floor. A wavery second later, it chundered into the bog. The piss lasted 43 seconds. My record's 52. He pulled out loads of bog paper to mop up the spillage. Then Dad switched on the shower and got in. Maybe a minute passed before I heard a ripping noise, a dozen plastic pings, a thump and a growly sod it. I opened my eyes a slit and nearly yelled in fright. The bathroom door had opened by itself. Dad stood with his head in a turban of shampoo wielding a broken shower rail. Stark raving nutty he was, but right where my sack and acorn is, Dad's got this wobbling chunky length of oxtail just hanging there. His pubes are as thick as a buffalo's beard. I've only got nine. The grossest sight I ever saw. Dad's snorry skonks and flobbergobbers are impossible to sleep through. No wonder my parents don't sleep in the same bedroom. The shock of seeing Dad's things dying down now, a bit. But will I just wake up one morning and find that rope between my legs? It horrifies me to think that about 14 years ago, the spermatozoon that's turned into me shot out of that. Will I be some kid's dad one day? Are any future people lurking deep inside mine? I've never even ejaculated, apart from in a dream of Dawn Madden. Which girl's carrying the other half of my kid deep in those intricate loops? What's she doing right now? What's her name? Too much to think about. And we get this nice little bit. Outside Hithliday Muse, I realised I'd left my map on Rosamund's table, so I went back to get it. The blue door behind the desk had swung open, showing a tiny bog. Rosamund was taking a thundering piss, booming row, row, row the boat gently down the stream in a foreign language. Women had to sit down to pee, I'd always believe, but Rosamund pissed standing up with her skirt hoiked up to her bum. My cousin Hugo Lamb says in America they've got these rubber willies for women's lib women. Maybe Rosamund had one. Her legs were hairier than Dad's mine, which is pretty unusual for women, I thought. I was dead embarrassed, so I just took my map, quietly left and walked back towards Mum's gallery. This kid seems to spend a lot of time watching people piss. We get this little bit. I was going to invite you over this Saturday, said Moran. Dad's got a video recorder off this bloke in a pub in Tewkesbury. Despite my problems, I was impressed. VHS or Betamax? Betamax, of course. VHS is going extinct. Problem is, when we got the video out of its box yesterday, half its insides were missing. What did your dad do? 
drove straight over to Tewkesbury to have it out with the bloke who'd sold it him. Problem is, the man had vanished. Could anyone at the pub help? No, the pub had vanished and all. Vanished? How can a pub vanish? Sign in the window, we have ceased trading. Padlocks on the doors and windows for sale sign. That's how a pub vanishes. Bloody hell. And obviously Betamax did not win, although it was the superior former. Yeah, reference to Neil Young. Neil Young sings like a barn collapsing, but his music's brill. Yeah, fair. And we get a uh, chapter starts here. That ace song, Olive Salami, by Elvis Costello and the Attractors, drowned out whatever Dean yelled at me. I think he means Oliver's Army. And then he starts writing in a, an exercise book. And he writes, That A song, Olive Salami by Elvis Costello and the Attractions, drowned out whatever Dean yelled at me. So it's kind of meta. We get a reference to him writing this book, even though obviously we know that David Mitchell wrote this book. Secrets affect you more than you think. You lie to keep them hidden. You steer talk away from them. You worry someone will discover yours and tell the world. You think you are in charge of the secret, but isn't it the secret that's using you? Suppose lunatics mould their doctors more than doctors mould their lunatics. Deep. And I'm 14. And then the way the book ends. This is actually a John Lennon quote from um, what I understand or a variation on it. It'll be all right. Julia's gentleness makes it worse. In the end, Jace, it doesn't feel very all right. That's because it's not the end, but it is the end of the book. So, Black Swan Green by David Mitchell. I gave this one probably like a four out of five. To me, it was interesting because it reminded me of my own childhood. I guess because I grew up in the British Midlands. So even though this was like 1982, um, Things hadn't changed much in the Midlands by 2002. So a lot of the like insults and you know slang and all of this stuff are the same. Um, a lot of the characters were like recognisable as sort of similar people to the people I grew up with. So yeah, it was kind of interesting because of that. There's someone at the door. Or is that just my neighbours going to get their laundry? So yeah, Black Swan Green by David Mitchell, four out of five. So there we have it, that's what I made of Black Swan Green by David Mitchell. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.